coming up on November 3rd, well, that's a very important day for us in the United States because that's election day. And with everything going on right now in the world, there are a couple of different options for you to vote. We're going to talk about that. And we also had a round table discussion talking about the current state of the White House. And I think it's going to be a very interesting discussion that you will want to be a part of. So stay tuned for All Things Newark. Dinkins and welcome to All Things Newark. November 3rd is a very important day for us in the United States because it is election day. Now, given the background of COVID, there's a number of different ways that you can vote. You can vote in person to the County Board of Elections, you can vote by mail, or you can vote in person day of on November 3rd, or you can vote by ballot box. The ballot box here at City Hall in Newark has been very active. Let's take a look and see who's voting. Hi, what's your name? Brian. Ryan? Brian. Brian. Yes. <laughs> okay, so Brian, this is great that you're voting. I am. Because we're doing a segment on dropping your ballot in the box. Okay. And here he is. <laughs> so that's great. I'm happy to vote today. Yes. <laughs> I voted. Awesome! <laughs> awesome! So Brandon McCune is getting ready to cast his ballot. It certainly is. Tell me, why do you think voting is important? Oh my goodness. I mean, listen, we all have a part to play in the direction that our country is going in, that our cities are going in. And so if you don't cast your ballot, then you're giving up your say. You're giving up your chance to, to say what's important to you how you think things should go. So it's just it's, it's such an important duty for each citizen to, to perform. Because we all, we all should play a part in, 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 in the direction that our, our societies are going in. This is just one way to do it. If someone was sitting on the fence about voting, what would you say to them to get them off that fence? If someone were on the fence about voting, I would tell them, there's too much going on. There are too many decisions to be made, to be sitting on the fence. Our children need us to make choices for our community. Um, the future is in how we direct our society, our civil leaders, and we do that by speaking and they hear us when we vote. Look at, look at what we're going through. Look at the ball of confusion. From China, from Russia, who needs that? The United States need people to stand up for America. And right about now, they're not standing up for America. Because if we did, we wouldn't have this ball of confusion of what we have going on now. Right. You see what I'm saying? So that administration, they could have a nice day as far as I look at it. So you think we should fire Trump? Top of the list. Start from the top, work your way down to the bottom. Same way we would do. It's just like, we in Newark. We know what we like, we know what we don't like. We got a right to say nay or yay. So right about now, it's time to go. Time to go. It's time to go. Right now, I'm here with a few friends and we're going to discuss the upcoming election. And I'm glad you're with us and I'm glad that you can join us. So let's get started. Over the past four years, we have been through a lot. And I just want you to tell me, what are your thoughts as you reflect on what you've been through and where would you like us to go? I think that the, the, the country is being run by someone who's not really in tune with what, with 
Americans are really feeling right now. And I feel as though anytime I watch the news, there's going to be some form of negativity on there that's just been way too much to deal with. So I'm hoping that in this new administration, if we have Joe Biden come in, that we can just be on a positive sense of who we are. People can just kind of turn around and feel good about themselves again. Well, I have to second the notion that it's been exhausting uh, dealing with all the noise from the media, the Twitter accounts, the Twitter tweets, everything else. What's shocked me is that you can understand why somebody might be doing something to make money or to gain power or to gain influence, but I just don't understand so many of the things that the Trump administration is doing, rolling back so many environmental protections. Uh, it doesn't benefit anybody. Give me some qualities. Tell me three words or less. Qualities like of Joe Biden as you see him running. What are some qualities that you have? Qualities. Okay. Me. One, honesty. Mm -hmm. uh, being the leader of this country, the respect. Mm -hmm. How you conduct yourself. Mm -hmm. How you respect others, and most importantly, how you deal with our allies. Mm -hmm. uh, when you don't have that, then the country itself right now is embarrassing as an American citizen mm -hmm. in terms of what we're going through. Uh, I'll give a little example. I went to Trinidad uh, some years ago, and this person is a big wig. And he says, you guys got a crazy president. And he laughed. Mm. Now, this is happening all over. And I was watching CNN. Uh, I was watching Fox. But I was watching CNN and where they had the other prime ministers and presidents. And as soon as Trump walked in the room late, they laughed. So this is what the leaders of the other world, of the other countries, is thinking about America and this embarrassment. So if you don't have trust, you don't have respect and compassion, mm -hmm. then you don't have it. Mm -hmm. But I would like to say about Mr. Biden, uh, empathy. Well, that's very important. Mm -hmm. His ability to mm -hmm. understand and beyond understanding, to care about a normal person not just a, a big wig or a political contributor or a financier or um, a Christian evangelical. In other words, Mr. Trump cares about people who are useful to him. Mm -hmm. I think Mr. Biden cares about everybody. Right. Mr. Biden's going to be the president for Wall Street. Mm -hmm. He's going to be the president for big oil. He's going to be the president for big banks. You know, these people are part of our country and allow us to create the prosperity that hopefully we can all enjoy. On a scale of one to five, one being good, five being bad, how do you think Trump has handled it? And what do you think that he could have done better, Jack? I think that if you want to look at how Trump has handled the pandemic, you just have to look at other countries. Um, Basically, every other country in the EU was hit by a similar flood of people who had initial infections. Um, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, they all had high initial infections like the US, but because they adopted proper mass procedure, they listened to scientists, they adopted stricter control measures, these countries don't have death tolls like the US. And if you look at a comparison of population numbers and infection rates, you can see that the relationship is completely off the scale in terms of the United States versus other countries. That's not just that the U.S. is bigger. It's because we're not controlling the infection properly, because the Trump administration hasn't been willing to make tough decisions that it needs to make in order to enforce coronavirus control. I met this wonderful woman, and she was telling me that she was having problems sleeping at night. She was waking up in the middle of the night. She was thinking about Trump. She's been thinking about the election. 
she shared with me a family member had died and she was debating on whether or not she should go to the funeral because a lot of her family members were Trump supporters and she's a Biden supporter and they always clash when they get together. Do you have any similar instances where something like that has happened to any one of you? I'll leave the floor open. Well, I have friends that um, that's on Facebook at least, to work together, and of course I see some of their comments in terms of about Trump and how they feel very good about Trump and what Trump is doing. Uh, I say to myself, that's their opinion. Uh, people see things differently. But that's America, freedom of speech, and what you want to, who you want to support. Me, myself, I would not get into any type of conflict because that's their belief. Mm -hmm. And I would like them to respect my beliefs and what I feel. I feel Biden would be the ideal person to bring this country back into full. Uh, and Trump will be the ideal person to leave the office rapidly. Of course. And for them, it has to do with their Christian religion. And um, I don't really understand it. I mean, I'm guessing because they won't talk to me. <laughs> Um, I'm guessing it has to do with the abortion issue, um, but there are so many other issues that are that should be pro-life. You know, whether it's the environment, thousands of people are going to die if we, you know, Trump has deregulated, destroyed, dismantled so many of the um, environmental regulations that Obama had put in place. So that's been. Um, destroyed, they're poisoning our water, our air, all these things. So people are going to die from that. People are going to be dying from COVID because, you know, he hasn't protected us. He hasn't um, done what he needs to do. You know, the hospitals don't have what they need. People, he's not encouraging people to wear masks. So who knows how many more people are going to be dying from COVID. One of Trump's uh, tactics is sowing chaos and leading by chaos. What is your thoughts on that? I think it's a really powerful tactic that he's putting to good use. I think you look at his history as a talk show host and as a celebrity personality, and what you see is a clear history of using drama to distract from drama. So whenever he has a gaffe, or a politically uncomfortable position he wants to put forward, or an appointee that he wants to make, he doesn't want that to be in the news, he can just release some, or not, not intentionally release right. bad news about himself, but right. it distracts from itself. Mm -hmm. Because the public has a limited attention span because we have to live our lives. We have to go out and do the things that we want to do to, to be happy and be, to be productive. And when you have an endless stream of bad news, or of confusing news, or of what he likes to term as fake news, mm -hmm. it becomes impossible to keep up. And you become desensitized to what you're supposed to be paying attention to. And so if you look at... President Obama, who was blasted in the media for wearing a tan suit, <laughs> which is hilarious in hindsight because gaps like that are happening every 40 or 50 seconds. <laughs> What's wrong with the tan suit? It's, 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 it's nonsensical, but it's a powerful tactic. It's a powerful tactic. And it's something that I think the American public and the American media were unequipped to deal with. Have you ever felt just so overwhelmed with everything that's going on that you just can't take it anymore. Have you felt like that, Michelle? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I used to be a CNN junkie, and, you know, with the, everything that's happening now, I just don't even want to watch the news. I almost get a headache all the time. It's I the turn Trump it on. show. It's the Trump show, and it's just one piece of nonsense, being, you know, with another one. It's always something, so. Do you think the fact that Trump has um, not denounced white supremacy groups, does that make a difference? Yes. yes. <laughs> Are you kidding? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. The fact that um, he seems to be instigating 
terrorism, domestic mm -hmm. terrorism. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, here, you know, right, this stand, stand down, stand by, and then these white supremacist terrorists attempt to um, kidnap the governor of Michigan mm -hmm. and possibly execute, put her on trial and possibly execute her. And what does Trump do? He continues to berate her and, and yell for freedom in Michigan. It's totally obvious that Trump is racist. Um, you can look at his policies, you can look at his speeches, you can look at the way that he interacts with um, white supremacist groups or, uh, you know, David Duke or any other famous, you know, the KKK. Um, took him a very strangely long time to, to turn down their, their recommendation of his presidency. It seems like the kind of thing that should be very easy to <laughs> renounce yes. and yes. seemed to not be easy at all. In the last debate when, um, you know, he was told that he was being endorsed by white supremacy groups and asked if he was going to renounce those, he immediately, instead of saying that he was going to renounce them, he decided to attack um, leftist groups and say that they were the real extremists. When it, that should have been a very easy political victory for him to say on camera in a debate that he denounced those kinds of groups. And he didn't, because they make up a large part of his power base. Exactly. That's and when he refuses to denounce them, He's saying in code to them, to these people, that I will support your interests and I will protect the power of, you know, white, su white supremacy in the U.S. Okay, so I'm going to say two words and I want everybody to respond when I say them, okay? And we're going to start with you, Michelle, and just go around the room. George Floyd. Well, that's a very heavy topic. <laughs> it really is. Um, completely unfortunate everything that happened with that situation. Um, it was definitely a stressful time and then adding the pandemic on top of it made it a lot worse. So I think that it was, you know, an opportunity for, you know, a lot of people to kind of speak out and see um, what's happening with the police and everyone trying to get together and try to hopefully work together so that those type of things wouldn't happen again. So it's horrible. In the U.S. and when we look at the history of the police system and the way that it brutalizes people who are, are black or uh, you know a different demographic status, um, there's no question that police brutality is an issue in the U.S. that has always been underappreciated. And I am just thankful that we now live in a world where these kinds of issues can be recorded more easily because frankly, if we didn't have stuff like cell phone footage these days, this stuff has always happened. It's always happened in the US. It's been happening for hundreds of years. And I'm just glad that we now are able to actually appreciate just how common it is, how often it goes overlooked, and we can get a frank look at the systems that are set up to exploit people who don't have adequate ways to defend themselves from police systems that often oppress them. Wake up call, we've all known that these things have been going on, but if we have to see it in front of our faces every day and every night and talk about it with our children, I think that's a good thing. I hope that that can be a positive that comes about. I don't, and um, we have, again, we have just have to be respectful of one another and not let people tell us that defunding the police or changing things is going to lead to chaos. We don't know what's going to happen, but we have to have a, a system and a way of treating each other that's less dependent upon policing and more dependent upon caring for each other. Thank God to modern technology, because you think that was just one video. Think of all the incidents that have taken place where there was no video. Uh, maybe that one video, but there's probably 1,999 incidents that took place. It is sad. It's sad to, oh, being a father that has sons, or even having daughters, mothers, fathers, daughters, you're concerned. And not just black, but also white as well. Because you, the cops, they're, 
their attitude nowadays and how I see and based on what's been out there shown on TV. Some of them are lawless. And it's gotten worse since Trump has been in office. Uh, basically, he gave a rubber stamp, especially when he was on TV and he says, well, when you put someone in the car, make sure they hit the head. Mm -hmm. So he's encouraging the disorder amongst the police. So um, it is scary, very scary. George Floyd was pretty eye-opening. The whole situation was an eye-opening situation, I would say for black Americans and for white Americans as well. Um, before um, we had Tamir Rice, we had um, all the others, Sandra Brown, and it seemed like there was this cyclical pattern of, you know, there's this thing that happens between black Americans and police, and we want justice, and we uh, scream and cry for, you know, support and it's not there but then you have this eight minute and 46 second video of george floyd's life be being taken from him and you can see from start to finish the injustice that happens to black americans daily and i think um unfortunately it happened in the right time where folks were not at work not at school but home and able to give the attention that this so very much needed and um, it was I don't want to say it was an important thing that had happened at the time that it did but I think it was very significant at the time that it did all the circumstances were right and it garnered the support from banks it garnered the support from white celebrities it garnered the support from folks we hadn't necessarily seen before and it was able to carry out and we've seen the the changes that it has um, created for black America. For me, I would say that Floyd's you know, death was kind of the tipping point in the situation, right? It, it created conversation and it created dialogue that we'd never seen before, right? We wouldn't be able to have this, you know, if, if COVID wasn't around, right? We had the chance to actually sit down and have the conversation, but you know, to this day, I still think conversation is not enough, right? We need to put action to where it needs to be met. You know, we need to figure out ways where we all can meet in the middle and how we can progress to not say that another life is now in jeopardy, if that makes sense. It's, it's interesting because as I ride around um, different areas here in West Orange, Maplewood, Orange, you, in Newark, you see a lot of signs that say Black Lives Matter. And that really, really makes me feel good. I was at the gas station today and this woman, this white woman had written a sign, a piece of paper and put it in her uh, rear window, said Black Lives Matter. And I walked over to her and I thanked her for that, that she's conscious and that she's aware, you know, and she's supporting, so. You know, kudos to people that support um, the notion that black lives do matter. I want to um, start to wrap things up a little bit, but each person, we're on the eve of possibly getting off of this crazy merry-go-round and maybe things can go back to normal, whatever that is if Vice President Joe Biden is elected. Michelle, and I would like everybody to respond, what would you like to see? I would just like to see people respecting one another again and just really being open and honest to different dialogue and just the end of all the divisiveness. So we can just move past that and get back to a point where people really care for one another. That'd be awesome. If Biden is elected, I just want to see systems where we don't have one of the highest incarceration rates in the world, comparable to only China and North Korea. We don't have pull out of climate agreements that every other country, developed country in the world has agreed on. Um, we don't you know, allow for pandemics to spread, that we have systems in place to prevent and refuse to use those systems. I want to see a system of governance that understands that the US really does have a lot of issues. It has a lot of issues. 
economic issues, justice issues, environmental issues. And when we refuse to address those problems because we keep saying that America is the best, you're, you're just destroying the opportunity that people deserve to have. And it's, it's, it's not enough to just say, oh, let's go get the Senate and let's pass some legislation. We've got to realize they're, they're trying to take money out. They're, they're trying to take money off of our table. They're trying to concentrate the wealth, you know? And it's, it's not enough. And we need to be working about income, income equality. We need to say, let's not preserve the Affordable Care Act. We need to be moving to a system where there's one payer, where we realize that it's a mark of national security to have a healthy population. A healthy population that doesn't have to worry about the next procedure. We realize it's cheaper to get your blood pressure taken than it is to hide from the doctor because you can't afford the copayment. You can't afford to go in. We need to be ma making these progressive things. We need to be saying that it's, you know, it's a source of economic growth to be investing in our environment, in green energy, in renewable energy. And I'd like to see compassion. I'd like to see integrity. I'd like to see honesty. I like to put shock collars around all the politicians and every time they're on. Now that would be great. Ooh, Mitch McConnell? <laughs> yeah, right. And, uh, and, you know, the environment is a huge thing for me. I really think you need to really, I want to really focus on green energy for the future because, uh, you know, that we're really on a precipice here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we need to do the right thing or we're going to be even more trouble than we're already if there's someone that you know that's saying, well, I'm not excited about either of these candidates. I'm just going to sit it out. I'm not going to vote. So um, any person who's telling me that they are not going to vote, I am apathetic towards them and would try to encourage them that, you know, you're not just voting for a president. You're voting for the House of Representatives. You're voting for a Senate. You need to get involved in local politics because those are the things that affect you personally. And people who cannot decide, then you have to encourage them to, okay, what do you value? And then can you match your values to whatever candidates are running for office? So I'm, I think people just need to understand the importance of, um, one, understanding what they value, what things are important to them, what's, um, what impacts their daily life, and which candidates represent them in their daily lives, and then voting for those candidates. A lot of people just um, go for the whole Democrat or Republican, and um, it's not just black or white, and that's the th thing. We have to get out of this dichotomous thinking, um, but mostly if anybody came to me and said that they weren't going to vote, I would pretty much try and dissuade them from that decision and try and get them on a track of, you know, let's, let's think about this for a second. Let's think mm -hmm. about what your morals, your values are, and let's, you know, move on from there. Well, everyone, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for coming out today and for sharing your thoughts and feelings with us as we lead up to election day. I really, really hope that we see a change in office. And I am glad that everyone tuned in and I hope you enjoyed the show. And until next time, we'll see you again on All Things Newark. today and Steve has some interesting items out here for sale. Mm -hmm. Steve, tell me about these grills here. Well, Pretty this, impressive. This is something my father started and uh, my father was a welder. Mm. My grandfather was a welder. Kent Steel in Newark, New Jersey at the port. Okay. So I used to watch them build grills and ships and everything else. So I said okay let's take it to the next level. So we started making grills from 55 gallon drums 500 gallon tanks, wow. 1,000 gallon tanks, to the rotisserie, to the double basics. Okay. So we said, okay, let's, let's have some fun with it. So okay. we took it to the next level.
Okay. So that's why they call it the unlimited grill. Because the only thing limited is their mind, right? Exactly. Because <laughs> you can go any direction. And you can go in. Hold exactly. on.